Hi there, my name is Stephanie Hoffman. We are here with Jesus Guillen. It is June 25th, 2018, and we're at Nicholson Library. And we'll start with our first question, which is why wine? Why wine? Uh, well, my background is in computer science. You know, I, I graduated back in 2002 as a computer systems engineer in, in Mexico, in the uh, University of uh, Chihuahua, where I'm from. Um, my idea was to just come here to the U.S., you know, stay for like maybe six months, uh, study English, and then go back to Mexico. Mm. During those six months is when I landed in, in this area. Uh, so this area, I didn't really know anything about, about wine, but I, I knew for all the vineyards that was a very important region, you know, for wine. So I started working, not, not working, but going, going to um, kind of different tasting rooms, tasting wine. Mm. And at first, you know, I didn't really like it because, uh, well, here uh, is, is the wine is it's Pinot Noir. It's very acidic and very uh, kind of elegant. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really know how to appreciate it. And uh, I didn't really like it, but um, the more I read about it, about the air and everything, uh, I, I realized, you know, that it was a really good, good region for it. So. Um, just went to m more tasting rooms and practiced more. And I started to uh, uh, learn to appreciate it. Um, so I was going to school for, for English, but also going to different tasting rooms and trying different wines and talking to different people, mm -hmm. learning from them. And when the two terms were due, like uh, six months after, um, I really liked Pinot Noir at this stage. and. Uh, I wanted to go back, back to Mexico, but uh, to think about the decision if I would stay here and pursue something in wine or going uh, back to Mexico, I, I, I went to wine tasting and tasted two wines that, that were some of the best wines that I've tried to, to date and uh, made me make the decision to stay here and pursue a wine making career or career in, in wine. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it was a very scary decision because my English was limited, uh, my winemaking skills or uh, wine knowledge wasn't as good, but I knew I liked it. So I, I'm like, I'm gonna stay here, see what happens in like an, a year or two. And if nothing happens, I can just go back to Mexico and resume my career. Mm -hmm. um, but then opportunities kind of arose. But, um, I think wine, you know, before, before then I was just basically drinking beer and tequila. <laughs> but when I came here is when I learned about, about wine and uh, tasting a lot, you know, gave me the practice to appreciate it. And uh, it, it's, it's just incredible, you know. Um, I had multiple really good experiences um, tasting wine. But when I went uh, wine tasting and tasted those two wines, um, those wines evoked like memories uh, like I was like, smelling the wine and smelling like a, like a pine scent, uh, like uh, like uh, like leaf scents mm -hmm. imagine myself kind of walking walking in the forest you know um, or I smell another wine it smell like a like 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 floral mm -hmm. um, so imagine myself multiple times walking around around the kind of the gardens of my grandparents and smell like that so that those experiences kind of made me uh, go for wine because I think wine is a beautiful thing and if you connect connect kind of to that level with with wine it's just uh, the, one of the most beautiful experiences that one one can experience yeah what were those two wines that made you stay it was the 1999 uh, Arcus Estate from Archie Summit yeah and the 1999 Elizabeth's Reserve from Alzheim. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I went there, you know, I didn't have a lot of money. Those wines were expensive. <laughs> but I bought like six bottles of each wine, and uh, I still have like one bottle of each, you know. <laughs> yeah. From yeah, from back then. <laughs> um, so you were saying that um, you mostly drank beer and tequila when you're in Mexico. Did it's you have any experience of wine before you came to Oregon? No. No. The only experience with wine that I had there, uh, kind of close to wine, it was brandy. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of the most the closest uh, to wine that uh, that I had drunk uh, back then. Uh, mostly because in, in Baja California area, mm -hmm. you know, there is the uh, Pedro Domecq uh, uh, cellars, mm -hmm. and that they make brandy, and but it's not <laughs> it's not like wine at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when you first decided to stay here and explore the wine industry, where did you first go? Uh, when I decided to stay here, um, I realized that I had to gain experience somehow. I, I knew I, you know, I kind of got a little bit of uh, the sensory evaluation for wine, mostly because uh, my dad, my dad was the first, the first one to come to the United States uh, in the year 2000. So it was mm -hmm. like a year and a half before I did, and uh, he started working for uh, for Tory Moore first, Tory Moore Winery, mm -hmm. and Tory Moore was farming. Um, different vineyards, along with the list of vineyards, they were farming also White Rose Vineyard. Um, my dad in Mexico was in agriculture, so he, he was working in the tractors here, mm -hmm. like a, as a tractor driver. Um, so when the new owner of White Rose, who, who bought the vineyard in the year 2000, uh, wanted a person to stay there because he's from California. So um, the old owner recommended my dad to, to work for for White Rose, mm -hmm. and that that's kind of the way he uh, he started kind of uh, working working there. Yeah. Um, kind of love the track there. So how did you become? Um, how did you start working there, or start being involved I, uh, in the industry? <clears throat> so I first came here, and I met the owner mm -hmm. um, of White Rose when, I, when my dad was working for him, and. Um, he kind of, uh, you know, he saw my interest in wine and kind of, because I asked a lot of questions and everything. So he was one of the persons who taught me how to really uh, evaluate wine. So the owner of White Rose kind of uh, transferred a lot of his experience tasting wine uh, to me. Um, sometimes, you know, because my dad used to live kind of in the first floor of the house and the owner in the second floor. So they were kind of uh, uh, interacting quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I came here to visit my dad is when I met him, and he would actually uh, invite me to to taste wine. So I used to come up up into the uh, second floor and uh, taste taste the wine with him. Mm -hmm. um, so when I decided to stay here, uh, I knew I wanted to I, need, I needed to learn about wine. The first thing I did was uh, go to Chemeketa mm -hmm. Community College, and because I knew they had the winemaking program, and see you know how could I get enrolled in that and uh, started to learn about wine. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I realized it was like a two year, you know, it, they had like a thing like a certificate was one, one, was one year. Mm -hmm. And then like, as an associate which is, is two years. Coming from college, you know, being in college for like four years and a half, I didn't want to really go through the same process again. Mm -hmm. So what I did, it was uh, kind of look, look, looked at, at their uh, list of books that were using in all the classes and uh, um, I started kind of buying the books uh, myself while I was doing this. Um, I just started working for Patricia Green Cellars in mm -hmm. the vineyard as a vineyard uh, laborer. And while I was, while I was there, um, the, the uh, vineyard um, manager, who, is, who was uh, back then Jose Garcia, mm -hmm. um, he, he started going to teach me a lot about uh, viticulture in, in general. Mm -hmm. Just kind of, uh, you know, raising the vines and just taking care of the vines and everything. Um, so, um, after, after, after that, when the owner of White Rose was um, looking for another person kind of in the vineyard, because my dad was working in the vineyard full time, but he needed another person, he kind of told me if I wanted to work for, for the for him in the vineyard, and uh, I told him, yeah. So, in like maybe I worked for Patricia in like six months, and then after that, uh, I worked in the vineyard for for White Rose a little bit, and uh, I helped them make make the 2002 vintage. Mm -hmm. I didn't really know anything. <laughs> I basically was just basically, uh, basically washing floors and and uh, scrubbing tanks and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But that was my first uh, kind of my first kind of immersion into, into the job. Yeah. yeah. Was there 
a moment where you thought you might want to stay in the viticulture area and stay become like a vineyard manager or did you always have the goal of becoming a winemaker? When, uh, when I tasted those two wines, I changed kind of my, my, my life. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I set the goal of, of making wine like that. Yeah. Um, making wine in which I can connect emotionally with the wine in that, in that way. So my goal was to, to make wine. Mm -hmm. So it was basically becoming a winemaker is what my goal was. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about, so you started in 2002 working with that harvest, washing floors. Can you talk about how you, start, you were there and then how you became the head winemaker at White Rose, what that was like? Yes, uh, so I started there in 2002, but the, the owner was making very, very little wine, maybe like uh, 300 or 400, 400 cases. Um, and that was basically his second year, so still, he still didn't have any wine to sell. But uh, he wanted, he wanted me to be involved in the business. So I, I worked in the vineyard as a vineyard laborer for almost two years at White Ross. Mm -hmm. That helped me really understand what, what to do in the vineyard, you know, to, to grow good grapes and, and uh, make good quality wine. Yeah. Um, in 2004 is when he kind of built the, the facility and uh, he kind of transferred all his wine from other facility to, to that uh, facility. And that's when I was working like uh, maybe half time in the winery and half time in the vineyard. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the winery, he was actually making the wine with the help of a consultant winemaker, which uh, is Mark Vlosek from mm -hmm. St. Innocent. Uh, he was kind of helping Greg make, uh, make the wine, just consulting for him. When I moved to the cellar, uh, and Greg sometimes, you know, he's from California, so he had to travel back and forth quite a bit. And a lot of times I was there by myself in the winery. So Mark would come and uh, I realized he was, you know, the consulting winemaker and uh, he was really, really knowledgeable. I mean, making wine since the 80s. Yeah. So uh, I realized that if I wanted to learn about wine, it would be through him. So all the questions I had about, about wine, I just asked Mark. And I could say that uh, he, you know, he's my tutor. He really taught me a lot and from his experience and uh, I learned a lot about how to make wine from him. Yeah. Um, and that was in 2004 when I kind of was working half and half. Maybe like in 2006 when I was working full time there and, and get, get kind of uh, gave me a title of the cellar master mm -hmm. um, and kept working there until the year 2008 in which he basically told me, hey, you know, I think you, you know as much as I do and you are making, you're doing a very good job so you can be the winemaker here. Okay. And in 2008, it was, I was named winemaker for White Rose Estate. When did you, or was there a moment where you felt like you were really confident in your winemaking skills that you like knew what you were doing at yes. each vintage? Yeah, each year, you know, um, I mean, my goal was to make wine, uh, not really become a winemaker, but to make wine in my own. Mm -hmm. um, so in 2006, it was a very warm year. We were farming uh, like three and a half acres from uh, Vista Hills Vineyard, which is right next to White Rose. Mm -hmm. And uh, back kind of in the day, in, in that period, uh, like June, July, it was very warm. So um, voles, like th these little uh, mice-like things, mm -hmm. were kind of biting into the trunks of the vines at, of those uh, at, at, at Vista Hills Vineyard. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they killed maybe the, about 1,300 vines. Oh my gosh. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, by, by the time of harvest, you know, like early October, Greg and I were kind of talking and uh, went to, to that field to see, you know, to kind of assess the situation. And um, the fruit was good, but uh, Greg didn't like it for, for making wine for white rose. Mm -hmm. So he's like, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna have to tag every vine. And, and the vines looked, uh, bad. I mean, the, the leaves were very yellow and mm -hmm. they shouldn't be that way. Yeah. <laughs> so they were dying essentially. And uh, he's like, we, just, we need to separate these vines and uh, we need to harvest the good fruit from the other vines, but these vines, we have to pull them and just uh, rip them apart and, and replant. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's when, you know, being, being my goal, like all the time, making wine, I'm like, what's gonna happen with the fruit that is hanging in those vines? 
he's like, oh, it's, you know, it's going to be garbage. So it's going to get burned or something with the trunks and everything. And I'm like, well, uh, can I harvest it and make wine out of it? And he's like, you're wasting your time, but uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's garbage for me, so you can just uh, do whatever you want with that. Mm -hmm. And I have, um, with my brother, my dad, uh, my wife, we harvested uh, fruit from those vines. And uh, it was like, like one ton and a quarter. So quite a bit of fruit, and uh, he made three barrels from that fruit. He needed some tweaking because the acidity was very high and uh, the sugar was uh, low. Even for 2006, which was a warm year, most of the fruit was like like 24 to 25% uh, sugar mm -hmm. or breaks. Uh, this one was like 21, 21 and a half, which <laughs> qualifies as a ripe fruit, but it's not really <laughs> how it should be for, for 2006. Mm -hmm. So I tweaked the chemistry a little bit and made wine. Um, and uh, it was a very, I mean, very good wine. Mm -hmm. And uh, Greg was kind of impressed. <laughs> He's like, oh, dude, yeah, that's very good. Mm -hmm. This is garbage fruit, in, you know, because this comes from garbage fruit and you make this wine, it's, it's really impressive. Mm -hmm. um, the owners of Vista Hills, uh, because Greg, Greg kind of told the owners of Vista Hills about the situation and the wine I made. so. Uh, they were interested in, in trying the wine. One time they came to the winery and tasted the wine and they liked it quite a bit. Okay. So offered me to, to work as a partnership. Uh, they told me, you know, if you're looking into making wine, we can give you the fruit. Um, and I'm like, well, I don't really have money, you know, to buy fruit. He's like, no, no, we'll, we'll give you the fruit. You, you'll make the wine. You can talk to Greg and see if he, wants, if he allows you to make wine here at White Rose. Um, and make the wine, and, and at the end, when we, you bottle it, we'll split the wine 50 50. Wow. And I'm like, well, that sounds reasonable. And I asked Greg, and he told me, yeah, you can use the facility and make, make wine. Yeah. So since 2007, I've been making my, my, my own wine mm -hmm. on the side. Yeah. Did you always, because you said you always wanted to make wine, that was your goal. So did you always want a smaller label of your own? Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, I think after I made that, made that wine, and then I was, I made wine in 2007 as well. When I became winemaker in 2008, I, I considered that goal kind of accomplished. Mm -hmm. So I needed a new goal. And uh, then I'm like, well, the, the new goal will be to, to make my own yeah. label. So since 2006, I made like uh, those three barrels, but one barrel I, I sold to Greg and two barrels sold to Vista Hills. So seven, was, I would say, it's the first year for my, my own label. Mm -hmm. I made like uh, 50 cases uh, per year, every, every year, you know, from, from Vista Hills Fruit mm -hmm. uh, until 2014. I increased to 460 cases and then in 15 to 1,000 cases to make it a more viable business. Yeah. So I, I have, I really, I have that label on the side. Yeah. Is it uh, any different than how you make the white rose one, or is it just the fruit? Can you talk about your label a little bit? Yeah, it's it's very it's very different. I mean, for white rose, you know, uh, I think the owner Greg is being being uh, is has been experimenting a lot with a lot of different techniques to kind of achieve the house style for the winery. Mm -hmm. So early on, you know, we we were making wine just like uh, conventionally, like uh, everyone does it, mm -hmm. and. Uh, like just stemming the fruit, you know, just having the kind of the berries fermented with the, with the yeast and just put it in barrels and age it and kind of very basic how conventional is made here. And uh, we were finding that the wine was, was good, but um, he had this kind of sweetness, kind of this, this fruity sweetness because uh, you can have an unbalanced wine, like, you know, you can, you can have a very high, uh, very high acidity or very high tannins. Uh, you can also have very high fruit. <laughs> mm -hmm. The fruit can be out of balance as well. And uh, for us, you know, it, it seemed that way. Um, very kind of sappy, sweetie, mm -hmm. sweet fruit. And uh, we're like, well, uh, Greg, well, Greg is like, well, we have to remove this uh, sweetness. So we, um, back in like 05, 06, we experimented with different, uh, different yeast first and see what they would add. Um, they were, the wine ones went different from different yeast, but uh, it still had that kind of sweet fruit uh, uh, taste to it. Mm -hmm. So the next year we experimented with uh, oak, with different 
oak barrels from different coopers. And we were finding that uh, the oak was adding more spiciness and more notes, but still that sweet kind of persisted. Mm -hmm. um, until we experimented with whole cluster and that we added the stems instead of the oak. And that the stem, uh, it's not maybe that removed the sweetness, but maybe added something back to it. So it's at the same level as any other component. Mm -hmm. And the wine didn't seem, uh, didn't seem as uh, sweet anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, and since then we adopted the whole cluster fermentation kind of uh, technique to, to our wines. It was back in 2008 when I became my maker, I kind of uh, added more, more uh, stems to it. Mm -hmm. um, and then Greg didn't want to add any oak, so we, we added, we add some oak, but only like 10%, very little oak, and uh, we don't really age the wine on the leaves, so, so the goal for for making wine for Rydos Estate, it's actually to, to portray the classic attributes for Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. So being as pure as we can, um, not a lot of foreign uh, things like oak or, or, or surly aging. Mm -hmm. um, so the goal is to have elegant classic wines for White Rose. For my label, I just started off my label because I wanted to learn a lot of uh, uh, more techniques, you know, like uh, the use of more oak, the use of maybe uh, kind of ambient yeast fermentations, instead of commercial yeast fermentations, uh, or adding uh, leaves or surly aging for the wines. Yeah. So my, the goal for my wines, because I want to connect emotionally with the wine, is to have more complexity. Mm -hmm. So I use techniques to add complexity to the wine. Um, but they have to be in harmony, so it's not like I'm going to add oak and it's going to be oak, the, the main note of the wine. Mm -hmm. They have to be in harmony, not really in balance because balance can be achieved over aging, but more in harmonious, more in harmony. Um, with more technique, with more, um, more set of tannins, flavors, aromas and everything, I think personally I, I, I have a bigger chance to connect, uh, to have that kind of memory connection with the wine. Mm -hmm. so, so that's my goal with, with my wines, just have more complexity to be able to connect uh, or to evoke memories uh, yeah. from the wine. You had said that one of your goals besides just making wine was to make wine to the quality of those two wines that had changed your life and made you stay. Do you believe you've made a wine? I, I think I have done it, yeah. 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 Well, what was it? Do, is there like a certain vintage or is it just your quality of wine where it is now? I think the quality of wine is where it is now. I yeah. have enough knowledge and everything to be able to make high quality wine like, like that mm -hmm. at that level. And I think I'm performing at that level now, which is great. But I think the, um, was to make, well, my goal was to make quality to the level of those wines, but also to be able to, to recreate the experience that I had with those wines. Mm -hmm. And I think in multiple locations with my wines, I have that experience. You know, it's just when, when you're tasting like a wine or something that you, that takes you back when, like, you know, if you're smelling a wine that uh, smells like maybe uh, cinnamon and, and uh, like orange peel, mm -hmm. and, you're, and takes you to like a Christmas, you know, back like five years ago or something that mm -hmm. you were with your family and everything. So when, when a wine evokes those kind of memories is when that's, that's what I want to recreate. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so you talked about when you first joined the industry, um, you were just learning English. Um, so how did you overcome the language bar barriers that you faced um, while you were in the industry in the very beginning and then um, till now? It's, it was very difficult, um, but I enrolled in, at uh, Chemeketa here in my Pinville Center. You know, I would come maybe like twice uh, a week for like three hours in the afternoons after work. Mm -hmm. Uh, just to to kind of learn learn English, um, I see that uh, that my improvement got better once I lost the the fear about what people would thought about uh, me speaking speaking the language. Mm -hmm. Because back then I was very shy, and uh, even though even if I knew a little bit of English, I I didn't really speak it or, or kind of uh, practice it. Mm -hmm. um, until I said, you know, to, to hell with it. So I started speaking more, and uh, that's when I would go to the winery just, just to just to speak with the person that was tasting with me or mm -hmm. pouring wine with me. Um, because at, at first it was basically almost speaking with with signals, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, 
I got got better and better just by practicing a lot of my my language. Yeah. Um, watching movies, just uh, um, just engaging more with people, you know, and and, and talking a little more. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think at some point I, I reach a good level, and then I haven't improved since then, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I can hold a conversation and everything now, so which yeah. is good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what is it like um, being a Latino in the wine industry? Um, one of the things that um, that is really good about, about this industry is that um, they share everything. Well, not, maybe not everything, but they teach you a lot. Um, when I didn't really know any winemaking I would go to these wineries and sometimes I would talk to the winemaker there and uh, he would share almost everything, you know, all the even kind of more deepest secrets, you know, that, that, that he does with the wine. Mm -hmm. So that allowed me to learn a lot about, about winemaking in my own, just to going there and talking to people. Um, so I think this industry in general is very inclusive, like, mm -hmm. like uh, it's very friendly. So. From the industry side of things, I haven't seen um, obstacles for being a Latino. Even mm -hmm. even the owner of White Rose, you know, um, being a Latino helped uh, help, he helped me kind of uh, grow a lot into into what I'm doing now. Yeah. Um, so I was very fortunate and very lucky to find that path. But you know, if you look at the industry as a whole. Um, there is 700 wineries or, or something like that right now. And uh, there are maybe about 50 female winemakers. There is maybe two black winemakers and there's maybe two or three Latino winemakers. So there is uh, certainly um, not a lot of diversity, mm -hmm. you know, in the industry as a, as a whole. But, you know, uh, it's not, not racist or, or anything like that you know mm -hmm. people here are very very great about about it yeah I think people that come from other states are are the issue <laughs> not mm -hmm. not the people living here mm -hmm. um, so for me being a Latino it wasn't really challenging what it was challenging for me is that I didn't really speak the language the culture is so different mm -hmm. and also uh, that I didn't really know anything about winemaking and ch changed my career completely. Mm -hmm. So be overcoming those obstacles was the most difficult part for me because uh, I had these opportunities, you know, and I didn't really face a lot of challenges by being uh, a Latino. Mm -hmm. But now being a Latino is what I, what I see, you know, is, is like the industry as a whole is, is just very white male dominated. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's just that's, that's, that's a problem. One thing that I uh, also see uh, back then when I was trying to learn about wine, I, I, I was, because I, I didn't speak the language very well, I was trying to, to find someone who do, would speak my, my language and to teach me about wine. Mm -hmm. I didn't find anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that, that was the issue back then mm -hmm. too. <laughs> so it's always been a problem, you know, there is no diversity at all. Mm -hmm. Are you... Do you see any ways to improve that diversity in the industry? Are you trying in any way to help diversify this industry? Yeah, I think I think in general uh, we just have to change the the language. Uh, we just have to change the the narrative of of, of wine mm -hmm. because uh, people when when people talk about high quality wine and uh, when they talk about who is behind the wine, there is always the winemaker. And uh, that's that's not true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, to make a high quality wine, uh, you have to have a high quality fruit. And right now, here, who who grows the fruit? Mm -hmm. um, it's it's like ninety percent of the people working in the vineyards is Latino. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there is the visibility issue, um, and also the narrative is not helping uh, to portray the importance of what these people are are doing in the vineyards. Um, and, and, and hence for that, you know, there is a lot of kind of uh, society rules about that. But uh, I don't think, I think that's why people don't uh, give a lot of opportunity because they, they see a, a winemaker as being male and, and white. 
Um, so it's kind of the perception how how one maker should look like. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if we start to change the narrative, give it more visibility to the people that are really doing a lot of hard work, uh, it may change the thinking into the future. Definitely. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about changing the narrative. Mm -hmm. um, you're a part of a documentary that was just released this year, Red, White, and Black. Yes. What was it like being a part of that project? It's really great. I think that's just a, a beginning of what has to come. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's raising awareness that that uh, that we're also here, you know, and, and that that these kind of positions or these kind of jobs are also available f uh, for for people like like us. Um, so uh, for me, it's a great experience, you know, and uh, I, I think uh, that film is kind of helping a little bit ch to change the narrative of what it has to be said. Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely. So um, the people that are working in the vineyards mm -hmm. at the moment. Are there any programs for them to get into winemaking if they want to? Are there any ways for them to excel? Like, do you know of any programs that are trying to reach out to those to people who may want to go beyond just being a picker? I think in California they're doing a great job of yeah. uh, including that. You know, they have organizations like the Mexican American Vineyards Association and stuff like that that are trying to to increase kind of uh, the or encourage you know people to to when they in the winery and make wine. Yeah. Uh, I think here there is really not a lot of support in that uh, in that area, mm -hmm. but you know there is a lot of room to to improve, obviously. Yeah. So um, so as I said, you know, it's changing the narrative, but also being more inclusive. Like uh, for myself, it helped that the owner actually included me in, in in tastings, you know, to learn about like what what just sensory evaluation of wine. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had to learn everything in my own too. So I think uh, for people to have opportunities, um, kind of winery owners or, or supervisors have to be more open about including everyone in the great product that we're producing. Mm -hmm. um, but also um, the people have to have a goal of, 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 the, of uh, the desire you know, to, to become a winemaker or to work in a winery or something like that. Yeah. You know? Uh, I think it has to work from both sides. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, can you talk about the work you do for Salud? I really don't mm -hmm. do a lot of work for Salud myself, okay. um, but uh, we do donations. Yeah. Uh, so we donate and, uh, you know, they have this uh, gala and that they kind of um, get resources that way. Yeah. We have Salud come maybe like once or twice a year to, to see our workers, you know, mm -hmm. and I probably am the person who is in contact, contact with them just to bring them over. And, mm -hmm. um, but we are, I'm not really uh, directly related or uh, doing something for them, just, just probably helping them just raise uh, funds to yeah. do this. Why is it important for you to um, be a part of this organization and to help donate the wine? Uh, it's it's important um, because workers here don't have health insurance and uh, winery is actually, even though we're working a very luxury oriented kind of product, um, most of the time we don't have the money to, to provide, you know, or to hire a lot of people mm -hmm. and provide them with health insurance. So I think uh, they're doing a great job just to, just to provide the very basic kind of um, health, you know, help for them. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important. Um, to raise the money for them to work and just uh, uh, provide the necessary uh, health care that they need. Yeah. So you talked about how when you were in Mexico you got a um, degree in computer engineering. Mm -hmm. um, has that translated into your winemaking at all? Has like that background helped you in the wine industry? Yes. Uh, being an engineer, you know, you get a lot of uh, kind of physics and math. Uh, which you don't really use a lot, mm -hmm. but I think they change your thinking more to be more analytical. So I th that kind of helped me quite a bit, um, and also being able to to learn everything in my own and to find the to find the areas um, where everything should be more important to learn from. Um, and uh, computer systems, obviously. I mean, I made I made my own website. I have databases about uh, a lot of different things that I do with the wine, additions, uh, oak, uh, barrel databases and all that. And uh, 
I mean, I, I'm a very computer savvy person, and uh, uh, so that helps me just just a lot overall. You mm -hmm. know, with the I think overall engineering, just with the analy an analytical thinking, and uh, using computer systems just for being more organized and, and uh, having all the documents right right in my fingertips in the computer. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, definitely. Um, can you talk about, um, so your wines have um, received a lot of awards and high scores over the years. Can you talk about what it was like to achieve one of the highest scores for Oregon Pinot? Yeah, it was, it was kind of like a good story too because uh, when I became winemaker in 2008, uh, Greg, the owner, told me, you know, to motivate you, um, I'm just going to, you know, your, your wife talked about a lot about Hawaii and going to Hawaii and uh, it's one of kind of his, her dreams. Mm -hmm. I think if you ever get a good score from a magazine, like a 94, you know, 95, you're like, I'll, I'll pay you guys a week to Hawaii wow. just to motivate you to, to work well. When I first, when I first became my maker, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, you know, this is 2008. I mean, it's really, it's really a really good year. It might happen this year. He's like, oh, no, no, just... Uh, settle into the job maybe 10 years from from now you know, you'll be able to achieve something like that mm -hmm. and i'm like yeah okay i'll just work very hard and uh, we made the wines in 2008 um, and then in 2009 we also made the wines but in 2010 is when uh, jay miller the back then um, wine creator from the wine advocate mm -hmm. came to oregon and he he actually emailed us because he wanted to taste our wine because he never tasted the wines uh, on site Mm -hmm. And uh, so he came to the winery, he met with us, with, he listed the wines from 2008 Vintage. And um, then he left, you know, and, um, like two months later, this publication comes out. And uh, we got, I think back then it was only like a 195 and like uh, 494s and then 93s and on down. We got two 94s from that publication. Oh, wow. So, uh, so those wines allow me to play my reward of <laughs> going to Hawaii. So I went with my family to Hawaii for one week. Oh, nice. Yeah, the next the next year uh, for 2009 Vintage, uh, he also came over and uh, when he released the results, it was like a 96, which was at the time, the highest score that publication had ever given to an Oregon Pinot Noir. Oh, really? Yeah. Now, you know, there is, there is better scores. I think uh, like Irie Vineyards got like an 97. Mm -hmm. I think they got like a 98 for an older, older wine too. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and now the great thing that happened for Patricia Green, mm -hmm. you know, uh, they got the f perfect score from uh, one enthusiast. Yeah. Um, there's always the thinking that um, our wine should be compared to Burgundy. And uh, obviously Burgundy with uh, hundreds of years of experience, you know, with vineyards that are very extremely old. I mean, uh, and uh, some domains having the best Grand Cruz in the world, you know, I mean, those wines are some of those wines are unreachable. And uh, when they think about 100 point wine, they always think about those wines. But I think Oregon has its own way to achieve a 100 point wine. But I think it's, it's really good. This is really good because um, critics, critics now no, won't be afraid to give a 100 point wine mm -hmm. and be judged, you know, just because they give a 100 point wine. So hopefully that changes a little bit in the yeah. future. Yeah. Definitely. Um, would you ever consider going somewhere else to make wine, like Mexico, going back to Mexico, or going to a different region, or do you want to stay in Oregon? For for now, I would stay in Oregon, but I think uh, after seeing a lot of uh, good things about uh, the Valle de Guadalupe in Baja California, yeah, in Mexico, I definitely see myself maybe like 20 years from now. Uh, after I'm being successful in selling wine here, maybe get a piece of property there and start my own winery there too. Yeah. What would you grow there? Uh, they, grow, they grow a lot of different varietals, but I'm in love with Nebbiolo. Mm. Nebbiolo I, I really love, you know, because I've tasted a lot of wine from Italy, from like uh, Barolo, Barbaresco, uh, Piedmont area. Yeah. And I really love it. So I think uh, if I buy something there, it would be to plant Nebbiolo. Mm -hmm. Just like I'm passionate about Pinot Noir, and I'm, I'm also like uh, Nebbiolo quite a bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so mostly right now you're in the Dundee Hills AVA growing and um, using grapes from that region. Would you ever want to experiment with other regions um, in Oregon? For White Rose, we, we make actually wine from Dundee Hills, mm -hmm. from Chela Mountains, uh, Yamhill Carlton. Okay. 
um, for myself, I make from uh, Dandy Hills and uh, McGrimville Olivier. Mm -hmm. um, we, we love Pinot, you know, I love Pinot, and I think just the Northern Willamette Valley, within the AVAs that we have, yeah. um, we have really good vineyards to, to make really great wine. Mm -hmm. um, I have not really have the chance yet to work with other uh, areas uh, from Oregon, mm -hmm. like the Rock Valley, kind of Southern Oregon, but I've tasted a little wine recently, really good from Walla Walla area, yeah. and uh, I think uh, maybe in the near future, White Rose will be always be Pinot Noir. It's kind of their goal. Mm -hmm. For myself, I have plans. I have you know uh, more flexibility to work with different things. So if I would work with other varietal here, it will be maybe for, uh, from Walla Walla, like a cab or something like that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Cool. Um, so where do you see the future of White Rose going? You're saying it's always going to be Pinot. Um, mm -hmm. What else is in the future? Well. Um, the owner plans to have like a bed and breakfast right next to next to the winery. Yeah, it's a beautiful area. I mean, it's really kind of Asian. You can see almost everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, it's a beautiful winery too. Um, so he plans to build like a bed and breakfast there. Um, as far as the winery, I think uh, now you know we have like like maybe we we make like four thousand cases, and that's probably gonna be the the level of, of wine that we will ever make because that's the facility that we have. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the, the future is to make 4,000 cases of very high-end wine. Like right now we have maybe like 50% of the wine is like like $40 or so. And the other 2,000 are, um, you know, from 80 to $120 more or less. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, in the future, you know, um, what the owner wants for White Rose is to just grow into all um, really high quality wine and sell everything for $100 or so, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And then what's in the future for your personal label? For my personal label, uh, still kind of in the growing stage right now. You know, uh, right now uh, it's, it's being able to pay, to pay its own expenses. Mm -hmm. um, in the past, you know, I, I, I had to put money, money and money every year. But now, I, I think last year, I didn't put any money. So I was able to kind of balance that out. Yeah. And at this, at this point, still kind of going in that direction. So there's a lot of room for, for growth, you know, for myself. I'm making 1,000 cases. Mm -hmm. my, my goal is maybe to make about three to 4,000 cases of, of wine. Maybe Pinot Noir, uh, Chardonnay, Riesling, and hopefully like a Cab or something from Walla Walla. Um, and... Uh, being able to sell everything direct, I mean, that's kind of, uh, kind of the goal. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's about maybe 50-50, 50% like wholesale, 50% uh, direct. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna grow into a business model in, in which I could probably sell everything direct. Mm -hmm. And being able to, to, uh, to provide work for my, for my family members, like my brother, my dad, uh, everyone there. So making like a family business. Yeah. Um, I want to make all this, you know, and enjoy kind of the process of this um, to hopefully someday have a very successful business that I can leave for future generations within my family. Mm -hmm. Hopefully my son, you know, and right now he says he's going to be an architect, but <laughs> I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> he can build a winery. <laughs> yeah, he can build a winery for us. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, my nephews, I mean, um, whoever wants to work in and get, you know, the reins of the business. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm hoping that they, it will be there for them. Yeah. Have any of them, so you said your son wants to be an architect, have any of your nephews had any interest of wine or anything like that? No. No? <laughs> no. <laughs> now they're, uh, I name all my, my wines after, after them. Mm -hmm. Like I have a high level reserve named after my, my kid, the other two wines named after my two nephews, and mm -hmm. the one rosé named after my, my mom, mm -hmm. uh, Rosario. Um, right now, as you say, that it's very cool to have, you know, their their names on, on the bottle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> First steps. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> and then, uh, um, where do you see the um, Oregon wine industry going in the future? Oh man, um, it's kind of like a difficult, difficult question. But I think we have a really good, uh, really good community right now here. Mm -hmm. The community is great. I mean, we. We borrow equipment to work, <laughs> you know, from everyone. Yeah. Um, and we borrow knowledge from everyone. Um, everyone is very talkative, very, they're willing to share experiences. 
So it's very uh, inclusive within us. It's a very nice community. But uh, with the French coming and buying a lot of land and uh, the California guys you know, coming and buying a lot of wineries and land as well, I just hope that we don't, we don't lose that kind of sense of community. Mm -hmm. Because obviously in California and Burgundy there are very different, different uh, thinking, mm -hmm. you know, uh, like, uh, like they, they, when they have a wine, they only think for themselves, they don't want to share anything, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, uh, here, you know, I think we, we see Oregon wine to be the brand for, for Oregon. Mm -hmm. And obviously if someone wants to make wine here, we, wanna, we want to make high quality wine. So that's why we share, share everything that we have, you know, that, so he, he puts the name of Oregon high as well. Um, but with other people coming here, you know, and uh, I've seen now a lot of uh, kind of non, non disclosure agreements, you know, being signed by winemakers, mm -hmm. uh, basically kind of encapsulating everything that they're doing and not sharing anything. So, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I just hope, I just hope that the future of the industry stays kind of in the, in the same, like uh, community, community based, uh, uh, industry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is there anything else you're worried about for the future um, besides the community maybe changing? Yeah, I mean, uh, global, global warming, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, uh, um, the last, uh, the last four years have been challenging because of that, you know, uh, 2014 was the warmest year in record and then 15 was the hottest year in record. Then 16 came along and the, the, the winter was the warmest in record. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just uh, kind of a scary situation, but I think uh, it's going to be a good future too. Probably not not very well for Pinot Noir, but I will see more Chardonnay and, and maybe Gamay. So mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's exciting to see kind of the change. You know, more people are planting Chardonnay than Pinot now. Yeah. So uh, so obviously I'm, I'm scared for that, but uh, mm -hmm. you know we'll we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, are you, are you doing anything with the vineyard you're working with or with White Rose's estate vineyard to like help prepare for climate change or is it just kind of one of those things you just have to wait and see what happens? We'll have to wait and see what happens. I mean our vineyards are very well established so obviously we're not going to um, replant them. Mm -hmm. um, so far, I mean it's, it's been warm but we haven't seen enough, uh, enough damage or enough uh, things to worry about just grafting everything or something like that, you know. We still are able to make very high quality Pinot Noir within the, the quality constraints that the mm -hmm. uh, vintage dictates. Um, but uh, ourselves, we're just basically just uh, attacking that in a, as a, in a very cultural kind of way. I mean, we, we add the stems, we add cold clusters, so we're able to, to have less alcohol in our wines that way. Mm -hmm. Um, we are not removing leaves, so we don't have a lot of sun exposure. So we're changing a little bit how we do things, um, just to keep everything more and more in balance. And you know, we, with uh, with the warmth what we had, uh, basically the, the sugar goes high and the acid, you know, goes low. Mm -hmm. So that's always the challenge of, of bringing everything to balance. Yeah. And um, yeah, so we'll we'll see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> And then what advice would you give an immigrant who's thinking of joining the Oregon wine industry today? What advice? Well, um, it, kind of, it kind of depends. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, if someone wants to come here to the industry to work, um, you gotta have, you gotta know what you want. Um, you don't wanna come here and, and you know, and, and think that you're gonna earn a lot of money or something like that. It it's doesn't just doesn't happen that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but first, you know, to be able to to be able to to succeed in this business, um, it's it's gonna be hard because I, I because I told you before, you know, the the industry here is, is just male, white, dominated industry. Uh, so you're gonna have a hard time to to earn those kind of positions, you know, in in, in the industry as a whole. Mm -hmm. But the best thing that you can do is, if you don't know language, you have to learn the language to be able to to succeed, mm -hmm. and also be able to learn the language of wine as well. 
Um, so those are the two tools that you need to succeed in, in this industry and just mm -hmm. work you're just work really hard you know yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah and that's all the questions we have for you is there anything else that you want to say any questions I should have asked the Janet I think you covered pretty much uh, everything yeah okay, perfect awesome well thank you so much oh, pleasure um, yeah and then we'll go ahead and turn off the camera awesome.